my wife Rachel's older brother Eric knew I was researching this, and he said we were at Thanksgiving or something, and he said, "Hey, do you know, do you know where they tested the first atomic bomb?" And I said, "Yeah, of course. Uh, I've been researching it. You know, New Mexico, 1945." And he said, "No, man, that's what they want you to believe. It was really at this place called Port Chicago, California, 44, a year before this Trinity test." And I said, "Eric, oh, come on! He, he comes up with these crazy, you know, conspiracy theories, and he does it mostly to drive his dad crazy, which is kind of funny. But in this case, I just I was intrigued because I couldn't refute it. I didn't know what he was talking about when he said it was at this naval base." Yeah, check it out, Port Chicago, California. There was an atomic test. And I, I did what anyone would do. I go to Google, I start searching it, I look at Wikipedia. I know teachers don't like us to use Wikipedia, but come on, we can look at it at least, right, to get started. And sometimes it has good source material suggestions. But I was just getting a, a really beginning look at it. Sure enough, massive explosion, July 44, Port Chicago, California, hundreds of sailors killed. And then you scroll down these contents and there really is a nuclear bomb theory here at the bottom, on the bottom left here. And, uh, and the theory is that this guy came up with, it's, it's pretty wacky, was that this explosion, which we know happened in the summer of 1944, that this was an atomic bomb, that the, the Navy and the government had and the scientists at Los Alamos had figured out this bomb earlier than we thought and tested it. Either accidentally, the, the theory gets a little murky or on purpose at this naval base, this totally segregated naval base, which was uh, loading ammunition for the war and, and, and at which were almost entirely young black sailors. And so the theory is wacky. There are a lot of reasons why you can disprove it very easily, but what I was intrigued by was that story of this segregated naval base and then what happened next, because that's the really important and interesting thing is what the sailors did after this explosion and how they truly changed the course of events in this country. So I start researching it. Here's where I would do just exactly what I always do when I find an idea. I love finding an idea that I know nothing about. There was only one book about it. It was by this academic from Berkeley named Robert Allen, Port Chicago Mutiny, and I start reading about it, learning about it. And, and this is great. It's exciting to start with without knowing too much. Here's Port Chicago in the Bay Area of California, the famous parts, San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley. But you go inland and you see Port Chicago. So it really was a naval base during World War II. Here's what it looked like, kind of bleak looking. All the sailors who showed up there, they were from all over the country. And they, they described it as really depressing looking, just flat and barren. Uh, but all they did there was load ammunition. This was at a time that the Navy was completely, strictly segregated. And black sailors, when they either volunteered or were, or were drafted into the Navy, they, they were not allowed to serve on ships. So they showed up at bases like Port Chicago and were told very little. Basically, walk down the pier like these guys are doing and start loading bombs onto ships. And normally this is a job that would take years of training to do safely. And they knew that, of course, but they weren't given that training. They just were put right to work. And of course, in the military, you don't get to say what you're going to do. So there are some pictures of what life was like on the base. They're loading bombs, these 500 pounds bombs onto ships with no training at all. And they knew it was a disaster in the making. Keep in mind, a lot of them were really young. You could volunteer in the Navy at 17 with your parents' permission. A lot of these guys did, which is um, kind of amazing. I mean, they, they came from all over the country. It was really a diverse group of people in terms of their background, their education, economic background. And a lot of them felt very patriotic, even though they were living in a country that did not allow them to have equal rights or the rights that were already guaranteed to them in the Constitution. So they show up here. They they know that this is wrong. I mean, they're loading bombs in an unsafe way. And they know that the reason they're doing it is wrong because here we have a government that's talking about how we're, this is a fight for democracy. They don't enjoy democracy in this country. They're not, what, what people are fighting for are not, these rights that they don't have here in our, in our own country. So they know this is a very 
the situation is just wrong on a lot of levels, but really what they were worried about on a day-to-day -day level was the safety more than anything else. And sure enough, in the summer of 44, you don't need a wacky conspiracy theory that one of these ships exploded. We still to this day don't know exactly what happened. Probably it was, uh, the best theory was some, some of the, some equipment, a winch on, that was loading, lifting a bomb, somehow a break on it broke and something fell and sparked. And there was a ship with thousands of pounds of bombs and ammunition that exploded almost like a giant bomb, almost the size of one of those early atomic bombs in terms of the force of the blast. Blew the ship entirely apart, blew up a second ship and killed over 300 sailors. There was no one who was working at the pier at that time who lived. So literally no eyewitnesses to the blast. There are some store, some pictures that were taken that, as you see in this photo, look at this official, not to be released for publication because they were secret. And this story, we'll see some pictures from the newspaper, but these kind of photographs did not make the, the media at all until decades later. Um, it just devastated the base. It almost looks like a a nuclear bomb. Um, this is the most incredible picture, not because of the level of damage, but because this was a mile away. These were the barracks where a lot of the sailors lived and they were a mile away and it was knocked over. They had just, well, there were, there were shifts that worked around the clock. This, the shift of the sailors I mostly talk about in Port Chicago 50 had just gone to bed and just had lights out, but they weren't asleep yet. It was about nine o'clock at night when this explosion took place. And you could see the damage it did to the building. No one was killed out here, but there were a lot of injuries, flying glass, collapsing building. And they made it out. They put out fires. These guys were heroic. They rushed down to the waterfront to see if they could save lives. And then what's really, that's kind of the first half of the story. There's this disaster story. But where I think the story gets really interesting is is what happens next. They clean up the base and the, the, the pier is completely destroyed. So they're not going to be working here anymore, but they're taken to another base right in the, in the Bay Area, not told anything, nothing. But they know this is another loading base. This is all we do at this base is load ammunition onto ships for the war in the Pacific. So we're going to be put back to work doing the same exact thing in the same way for the same incompetent officers. And the officers did outrageous things like raced one division against another to see, you know, had their own little bets about which division could load faster, just terribly irresponsible things. And so they talked amongst themselves in the barracks, what should we do? And I show this picture of Joe Small because he's sort of, he was the leader informally. He should have been an officer if that, if that avenue had been available to young Black men at that time, people would have recognized this guy's officer material. He was just a natural leader. Everyone looked to him to see what he would do. And he was never afraid to speak up to his white officers, which could get you in a lot of trouble. So they turned to Joe and said, what should, what should we do? And can we just really go back to doing this thing that led to this horrible disaster? So many of our friends were just killed. That's on the one hand, and then the other, other, on the other hand is we're in the military, it's, it's World War II, you don't get to decide, they're not gonna just let us opt out of this work. And Joe is very clear to everybody, he said, I'm not gonna tell anybody what to do, it's too weighty of a decision, but I'm not going back. I'm going to refuse to load ammunition unless they change the way it's done. And that had a big influence on uh, on some of the guys. And there's a very dramatic story kind of right in the middle of, of my book where Joe and his division were being marched down to the pier and they knew if they turned one way, it would just be a normal day of exercises. And if they turned the other way, they'd be going down to the boats to load bombs and they turned that way. And they stopped almost as if as one, hundreds of sailors stopped in the road and the same thing happened throughout the day with other groups of, of sailors. And the, the officers got, got furious and they got everyone together on a baseball field and started screaming and shouting. And this general drove up in a Jeep and told them all that if they didn't go back to work right away, they would be 
court martial they would be charged with mutiny and not only that but they would be shot they would be executed if found guilty and they could assume that they were going to be found guilty and they had a, a few seconds and this is just incredible if you think about how young these guys were again a lot of them were teenagers how do you make a decision like that in a few seconds but most of them stepped to the side indicating yes i'll go back to work they were not they I mean, they lived in this country. They, they were not expecting a fair trial. But Joe and, and it turned out a total of 50 people still refused. This is where the Port Chicago 50, I didn't make that up. That became kind of a newspaper moniker that they had. 